My name is not Lily, and this is going to be a Let's Play of Neverwinter Nights, the official campaign. This is patched to final version 1.69 with no mods. I'm not sure how many people realize it, but this introductory movie is actually showing a young Lord Nasher Alagondar during his former adventuring days before coming to rule the city of Neverwinter, for which the game is obviously named. To be honest, I'm also not sure why his sword bears the emblem of the city, the uh, game's logo. But, from what I understand, this was originally only one part of a longer cinematic plan by the developers, which they unfortunately never produced. And, I don't usually talk over cinematics, but a more meaningful introduction is to follow after this one, one I actually created myself. And this seems like a good place to provide the following warning. This series, as a continuation of Lily's narrative from the Baldur's Gate saga, may contain spoilers from those Let's Plays. In particular, Baldur's Gate with the Tales of the Sword Coast expansion, and Baldur's Gate 2 with the Throne of Ball expansion. I'm sorry if that precludes anyone who might have otherwise been interested in following the series, but I need to be free to reference events from the past, since it could have a bearing on her character. Let's just see how the young Lord Nasher fares here. Otherwise, I hope you'll enjoy the following tale of what happened to Lily after throwing a bowl in the winter of 1369 Dale Reckoning, and how she came to find herself in the city of Neverwinter over two years later. <laughs> I'll join back with you afterwards for character creation. Honora. The question pulled from her lips by a kiss in the night. As Lily awakes, she catches sight of a fey-looking creature escaping through her bedchamber doors. It certainly looked like Anora's long, delicate form. And she even giggled like her, too. But it must be a dream. Lily quickly dons a black robe, sets her hair with a pin, and gives chase through the... Yes, a dream. Of candle keep, with no walls... Only windows hanging on empty air. Down the hall, chasing the freckled elven girl from her past, knowing it isn't real, but carry not. Down the stairs and into the courtyard. There, Anura has stopped. Turned around, her features silhouetted through her gown by the moonlight, as if waiting for... Lilac? Elsewhere, Imwen, who happened to be watching the night sky from a balcony, remarks to her esteemed company that she saw a falling star. As Lily reaches out to caress Anora's cheek, she recoils in agony as she finds herself plummeting through an otherworldly vortex until finally collapsing on cold stone in unbearable pain, as her divine soul is all but ripped from her body. This was no dream. It was simply an illusion. Where Nora stood is only a scrap of parchment slowly drifting to the ground. Lily musters the strength to snatch it from the air. It reads, Thanks for the imp. Signed, Cyric. Exiled. Severed from the plains. Everything gone. Her imp, Duke. Her spell books. Without a single one memorized, she's been robbed of her art. All her research into wild magic lost. A fallen goddess, powerless. Lily is about to have an avatar crisis of her own. It's dark and cold. She's standing at the summit of Mount Waterdeep, 1400 feet above the Sea of Swords to her west the city itself to her east, and under mountain beneath her. She starts to silently curse the Prince of Lies, but it quickly grows into anguished hysterics, screaming, sobbing, until at last, she loses her voice. That's about when she passed out. 
When she regains consciousness, she's shocked to find she's flying over the city of Waterdeep, thrown like so much baggage in the back of a flying griffin. She can't even see the city guard piloting the beast. They glide over the large private villas and walled homes of the nobles or otherwise rich of Waterdeep. And then, Lily sees an amazing sight. While passing by Blackstaff Tower, Lily sees Kelvin Blackstaff Aronson and Elminster outside on the balcony with none other than Emmeline. Lily opens her mouth to call her, but nothing comes out. Her voice is still lost. They pass Emmeline, the private villas, and the noble estates, and land in front of the yawning Portal Inn on Rain Run Street. The city guard chokes that if she can't afford the inn, she can earn it at Mother Selenka's house of pleasure next door. Waterdeep, City of Splendors, Lily's Hell in the Realms. She sets out immediately to find Blackstaff Tower, but becomes lost, which of course causes another bout of anguished hysterics. Finally, by the Wormbones Inn, she spots the tower and cuts through Buckle Alley to reach it. But while turning the corner, she must have said something especially egregious about Sirik, as it caught the ear of the proprietress of Nunreen's Marvelous Masks, who promptly calls for the city watch. And promptly they came, right outside the halls of justice on Bazaar Street, within sight of the tower and the now empty balcony, Lily is arrested. Violation of Waterdavian Code Legal including crimes against the city like vagrancy and brandishing a weapon dangerously or threateningly, in this case her hairpin, <laughs> crimes against the gods like public blasphemy of a god, in this case Sirik, and of course, because of all these charges, crimes against the lords, like blasphemy against a city officer. Her punishment? No less than six days and nights in the castle of Waterdeep Dungeon, Fines totaling 31 gold and an edict forbidding her to blaspheme the Prince of Lies within the city. While in the prison, Lily hears an amazing story. The crawling spider has been shut down. It seems the tavern was actually a fest hall that hired real drow courtesans who would lure their would-be customers into the undercellars where they would instead be tortured and murdered, offered as sacrifices to the Mistress of Pain. The whole city is abuzz with talk of Welverine's whipping girls and the mistress murders, but here's the part that caught Lily's attention. A patron told the city watch that one of the drow doxies was named Viconia. Now, that's not really what happened, but what can you expect from common gossip except the distortion of the facts? Viconia had established a cult of Shar in the tavern's undercellar, becoming as a dark lady. When she discovered one of her watchers, Lysira Alvinter, betrayed both her and the cult, she slew the entire Sharn clergy and fled the city. For the last four days of her imprisonment, Lily is forced to perform light labor on the castle grounds. As a dung sweeper, no less. Which is how she comes to be known by locals as Madame Manure. When released, Calvin Blackstaff Aronson refuses to see Madame Manure, and Lily is informed that no, she may not inquire as to his guests. Bitter and destitute, Hope comes to Lily in a half-drow named Shindia. The thief explains that her employer would like to be her benefactor for reasons she doesn't know. Lily gladly accepts. What Lily doesn't know is that Shindia's employer is Xanathar, a beholder crime lord who lives in the sewers of Waterdeep. As a follower of Ball, he hopes that by taking the last remaining Ball spawn under his protective gaze, he'll somehow gain favor from a dead god or even the Lady of Murder herself should she reclaim her birthright. After paying her fine, Shindia takes Lily to the old Zoblob shop on Filet Lane by the docks, a curio and adventuring trophy shop. Behind the serving counter are stairs leading down into the basement, with access to the sewers, useful for Shindia, a kitchen, and a row of huge wine casks. One of the casks is hollow, its front swings open to reveal a hidden room, Lily's new bedroom. Besides the free room, she'll be given a stipend of four coppers a day and free provender, including the green sparkly wine that the owner, Dandalus, makes in the basement. Lily promptly locks herself behind the wine cask and goes to sleep, missing celebrations as the city ushers in a new year that night. 
The next morning, Shandia wakes Lily by poking her head through a hole in the wall. Turns out the cupboard in the kitchen has a sliding back to allow passage of food and dishes back and forth. But Lily feels especially weak this morning and simply demands a bottle of green sparkling and to be left alone, which Shandia does. Lily does what she imagines any self-respecting goddess in her position would do under the circumstances. She enters an absolute depression, fueled by the never-ending bottles of green sparkling and her predilection towards self-pity. 1370 was indeed the year of the tankard. If not too drunk, she visits the docks at night. If sober enough, she visits the Thayan Embassy, one of the only places that even seems to welcome her, to browse its library or map room, or even the talk with the occasional visiting Red Wizard. It was at the Embassy that she read about the last remaining boldest temple in the realms, the Tower of Swift Death and Thay, switching to the worship of Sirik on the first of the year. Even though Shindia visits her every ten day, Lily has no idea how much time passes. She may have even missed a birthday. But not her 163rd, allegedly. On her birthday, she resolves to do something before a wine cast becomes her tomb. Before her exile, she wasn't entirely naive. She was at least aware of the instability of her appointment and decided to secret away a bit of her divine power in a pair of worn-out boots. She'd sent her imp Crispy into the realms to disguise and hide them, but he never returned before her exile. She's not even sure which imp Cyric was thanking her for. Maybe both. And she's not sure how he knew about Anora either. Maybe one of her succubi was an agent for Cyric, like Yahi, an anonymous birthday present for her 161st, allegedly. It's a seemingly impossible task with seemingly impossible odds. Find Crispy, or at least her old worn-out boots. They would likely be disguised and could be anywhere. Lily has to start all over again. And for that, she'll need plenty of coin. Her current life savings doesn't even amount to 30 gold. The spell book she left Candlekeep with over three years ago was worth well over 500. Suddenly, Lily has an idea and begins to pen a letter to Jaluth Snakeface Alareth, an overwizard of the Arcane Brotherhood. My dear Lady Alareth, by this letter, attested by her holy seal, her holiness, Lily Black, the Lady of Murder, wishes it to be known that she offers you, Lady Alareth, Overwizard of the North of the Arcane Brotherhood, a permanent reprieve from the malady which has bestowed upon you a most unfortunate informal title, Snake Face. Be it known that her holiness is not without pity, and is willing to remove this damnable curse if you placate her with both a pledge of fealty and a payment to be received immediately of one million coins, Gold. A bit of ordinary candle wax and a press of her heel, and her holy seal is affixed. Lily laughs, wondering if hissing fanged serpents will erupt from Jaluth's face when she gets to the part about Snake Face. Lily doesn't hear back from Snake Face, but she does receive a letter via the Thane Embassy from Lady Arabeth de Tilmerand, esteemed bodyguard to none other than Lord Nasher Alagondar of Neverwinter. Lily misreads train as teach and believes she's been invited to be an arcane instructor at the prestigious Neverwinter Academy. She totally misses the part about a play. Her plan? Gain the favor of Lady Tilmerand and eventually Lord Alagander himself, and amass a fortune selling secrets of the Lord's alliance to the highest bidder, likely to the Black Network. Her problem? She can't afford the journey. The next day, Lily hears news of the Emerald Dragon, a ship that sunk just outside the harbor in the storm the night before, and how the city guard hasn't been able to find a single member of the crew, dead or alive. That night, walking the docks as she does, she encounters a covered wagon, stopped with a broken wheel. The driver offers Lily seven gold to watch the wagon while he fetches a wheelwright. Desperate for gold, she agrees. After he returns with a new wheel and fixes the wagon, he offers her another two gold to guide him to the river gate. Again, desperate for gold, she agrees. But while sitting in the wagon with the driver, Lily notices it smells like rotting flesh. And he's acting very strange. Once river gate comes into view, he turns into a side alley, stops the wagon, and reaches over to strangle Lily. 
but Lily was ready. She stabs him in the eye with her hairpin and breaks free of his grasp. She dares to rob what might be in the back of the wagon before fleeing, though. In the back, underneath a bundle of sailcloth, atop a hoard of gems, is a hissing mind flare. And beside him are the stacked bodies of sailors, their brains sucked out. Lily boldly grabs a handful of gems and flees, shrieking for the city watch as she does. She later found out that the Mind Flayer was in fact a prisoner aboard the Emerald Dragon. He had dominated the crew and was attempting to make it out of the city by wagon, his driver a dominated sailor from the ship. Lily's lucky break. A bit of the Emerald Dragon booty. She can finally pay a stationer for a new spellbook and make the journey to Neverwinter. Before the spring of 72, Lily departs for Neverwinter. Unfortunately, she's forced to go on foot since no coachman of Waterdeep trusts that crazy manure madam who stabs drivers in the eyes. So, she travels under the guise of an old woman, a wandering trader of spell components, named al -Sharas. Within half a month, she reaches the foothills of the Sword Mountains and spends the next month hiking through the range itself. Before the end, she stops to perform an important task. She selects a peak overlooking the mirror of dead men to the north, with level ground. She sets out stones, creating a large circle and a small fire pit next to it. She then catches and kills a white mouse and places it into the fire. After a time, she's able to collect and clean the mouse's bones, which she leaves in the middle of the circle for now. After rekindling the fire, she sprinkles a mysterious black powder over it, which produces a thick black smoke that's carried by the wind over the Meridolaine below. She then kneels in the circle and sets to the meticulous task of reassembling the little mouse skeleton, using strands of her own hair to bind its joints. When finished, she closes her eyes and utters incantations in some black tongue over that little skeleton as it slowly begins to move. She quickly snatches it, proceeds to lie flat on her back in the middle of the stone circle, and cradles the trembling little thing to her breast, as if to allay its fears. Lily closes her eyes and enters a trance. Dusk approaches, the fire reduced to smoldering embers, and the little skeleton has become almost completely still, calmed by the beating of her heart. Then, Lily falls asleep under the moonlight as the fire all but dies out. Another kiss in the night, but this time it's a black panther licking the back of her hand, now empty, as the little skeleton is gone. It's her new familiar, which she appropriately names Bones. It takes Bones and his mistress almost half the month to cross the Mirror of Dead Men, and they don't reach their final destination until after Greengrass. Lily Black, the late Lady of Murder, a fallen goddess, has arrived in the city of Neverwinter and is ready to accept her position as Master of the Arcane at the Neverwinter Academy under invitation from Lady Arabeth del Timorand herself. But returning to Duramore and her former glory is what Lily really dreams about, her first nights in Neverwinter.